Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, All oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade, till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are a, a God of reconciliation, a God of mercy, a God of, who is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, as your word says. For apart from that, Lord, we would have no relationship with you, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for your mercy demonstrated and your love demonstrated in the cross of Christ. We ask you, Lord, to embolden us and strengthen us, Lord, to be able to share that message with our family, with our friends, with our peers, our co-workers, and, and even our enemies, Lord. Everyone that we come in contact with, that we would open our mouth and speak your truth. Lord, we also bring forth the petitions that were asked for this morning, Lord. You know the situations, each individual's hearts and situations, Lord. And we come to you, Lord, as the, the physician of physicians, the doctor of us all, Lord. And, and we ask, Lord, that you give wisdom to those who are treating our loved ones, to give them insight, Father, to be able to get to the root cause of each one of these issues, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you hear us, and we thank you that you are merciful, Father. And we ask for all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So a little background to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah's timeline is somewhere around 785 to 746 B.C. He has a parallel ministry with the, the prophet Isaiah. Right? So Jonah is writing around the same time in, uh, to the prophet Isaiah. As the prophet Isaiah. The background of the book is the Assyrian Empire, which has come under God's judgment. And Jonah is called to declare God's judgment on them. The capital of Assyria is Nineveh. That's why when we hear about Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They were a nation at odds with Israel and often befriended Israel's enemies in war against the people of God, Israel. In Isaiah 10, 12, it tells us that, that God used Assyria as a tool of judgment against Israel for their disobedience and sinfulness. But the Assyrians became very proud and arrogant and believed that it was because of their own might and their own wisdom that they were able to conquer Israel. So Isaiah also proclaimed that God would judge Assyria and that for this arrogance and that they would ultimately be destroyed as a nation. It is the Lord who raises up nations and it is the Lord who casts them down. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jonah chapter 1, the Bible actually says that Nineveh's wickedness grew up to heaven. And in summary of where we started, because we started in chapter 4, I'm going to give a quick summary of the first three chapters. Many of us are familiar with the story of Jonah. But we started in chapter 4, and we're going to, we're going to focus there, but I want to summarize the first three chapters. The beginning of the book uh, opens up with God calling Jonah. And God calls Jonah to proclaim his judgment on Nineveh. But Jonah refuses his calling because he hates the Assyrians and knows that if they repent, God will relent of his judgment and wrath. So Jonah flees from God's calling and he goes to Tarshish on a boat where a great storm arises and the men on the boat are greatly afraid until they finally realize that the storm is because of Jonah's disobedience. And Jonah is ultimately thrown into the ocean where he is swallowed up by a great fish. He cries out to the Lord and he is delivered from the belly of the, frit, from, of the fish. He eventually makes his way to Nineveh to proclaim God's judgment on the city. But the king repents along with the people and they call for a fast. And God's judgment and wrath are abated. Because as we've seen in chapter 4, he is, a, he is slow to anger and he is abundant in loving kindness. Right? But this, this upsets Jonah, right? That, that the king repented and that God's wrath was abated. It was, it was relented. And this is exactly where what Jonah didn't want in the first place. This is why Jonah ran, right? Because Jonah wanted the wrath of God to fall upon these people. You see, Jonah would rather see them suffer under God's wrath than to actually have their eyes open and to repent and come to God. This is one of the greatest revivals in all of Scripture. We see right here 120,000 people in the city. This is one of the greatest revivals, and Jonah is angry. Jonah is angry. You think he'd be rejoicing, but Jonah has hate in his heart for these specific people. Jonah is what we would say in, I guess, modern day language. Jonah is a racist. He don't like these people. And there's much not to like about him. We know that. But, but ultimately, as Jesus told us, we are to love even our enemies, right? And, and God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. You know, even, you know, there was a, I remember that verse coming to life when, when it was announced that Osama bin Laden was killed. And there's people out there, you know, having parades. And think, can we rejoice in the justice of God? Of course we can. Right? Did, did that man deserve justice? Yes. Right? He escaped justice. But we don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. We should be praying for the conversion of that man, that the mercy of God would be brought upon that man in repentance, that his eyes would be open to his wicked ways and that he would come to a saving knowledge of Christ. That's how we should think of our own enemies, right? But when, when we don't think like that and all we want, then we're not really have the heart of God. That is the heart of God, whether we like it or not, right? So that's where we begin in chapter 4. Is that is why Jonah is angry. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 4, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Jonah is angry that God was merciful to these sinners. Some people believe, right, that the Bible presents these two opposing gods. It's the God of the Old Testament who was, who was mean and angry versus the God of the New Testament who's loving and merciful. And if you believe that, you're, a, you're what they call a modern-day Marcionite. Who was Marcion? He was, a, he was a church heretic in the early centuries of the church, about 140. And he presented this view. And some people don't admit it, but they really believe that. It's like, I don't really like the God of the Old. The God of the Old Testament seems to be angry and judgmental. And, and in the New Testament, he's just so much more loving and, 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 and kind. And, and, Marcion, I, and Marcion believed that. Marcion actually created his own canon. Um, this is a very interesting point. Uh, I don't want to go too far down it. 
this is not the topic of the message today, but um, when we get into the canon issues, the issues of how we know what books belong in the Bible. Very early, about 140, all of the church condemned Marcy, Marcion. Um, he came up with his own canon. He picked one gospel, Luke, and he truncated it. Right? He, he, he cut it down because he wanted to remove the Jewish uh, uh, quotations from the Old Testament. Because Marcion believed that the God of the Old Testament was evil and angry, and Jesus was the God of the New Testament, and he came to defeat the God of the Old Testament. Heresy, right? The Bible says that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. It is the same God. If you read the Old Testament, you will read of God's love, and you will read of God's judgment. And if you read the New Testament, you will read of God's love, and you will read of God's judgment. The same thing. He is the same once again today, yesterday, and forever. And notice, notice here in Jonah, right, that Jonah's complaint is that God is too gracious, too forgiving, and too merciful here in the Old Testament, right? This whole God was mean in the Old Testament. He, he seemed to lighten up in the new. No, no, no. One of Jonah's complaints here in the Old Testament is God is being too merciful, too gracious, and too forgiving. He needs to be he needs to be more wrathful. No, he's he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you will read of God's love and God's judgment in the Old Testament, and you will read of God's love and God's judgment in the New Testament. Verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah oh Lord, was not what I said, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious. Gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. There it is. The Lord our God is gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. But once again, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Also, just on another side note, notice something. When Jonah comes to Nineveh, Remember he had remember all the miraculous things that had happened, right? He, he flees from God, the fish swallows him up. You know, he tries to run from God. He can't get away from God. He tries to what's the what's that song? Where, where can I go to flee the presence of God? I go to the highest depths and to the depths of the sea, and he is there. Right? We, we, we can't get away from God. But notice after all this miraculous testimony that he has, right? He doesn't go to the Ninevites. And proclaim that testimony. But he proclaims the word of God. And say, oh, you should have heard what happened. Never, if, if they understand this miracle, then they're going to repent. Let me tell them about these miracles. No, no, no. He goes there and he just proclaims what God told him to say. He proclaims the word of God. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life for me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Now, when I read this, I literally laughed out loud. And, and, and I'll tell you why. Because I see myself in the text. And I think we've all been there, right? He's, he's and, and, and wait for it. He's, he's not done. He's only getting started, right? Jonah is in a self-pity, in a, in a self-wallowing place. And he's wrong for where he's at, right? The problem with Jonah is, is Jonah at this point. He's mad. You know what I mean? He's mad because this city repented and came to God. He's mad at something he should be rejoicing in, right? He should be rejoicing in these things, but he's angry. He's angry. He's in self-pity. He's in despair, right? And he has no reason for it. Basically, my advice to Jonah would be get over yourself. Some say, well, you know, don't we mourn with those who are yeah. You should come alongside and be compassionate with those who are, who are suffering and mourning. But when he's mourning over something that he shouldn't be mourning over, it's not loving to go next to him. And, 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 and Like I've said before, when somebody's having a, a pity party, I'm not going to buy them a cake. Okay? I'm going to come to them gently and lovingly, but I'm also going to say, look, you know, it, you know, let me go here. During the whole, before all these riots and things started in the streets, I remember one of the reactions very early on, one of the reactions of the church is, well, Brother Ron, don't we mourn with those who mourn? And, and that was kind of the reaction of the church, well, we need to mourn. Well, wait a minute. 
wait a minute, to mourn for something that's not a reality, I'm not going to play that game. That's not a loving and compassionate thing to do. Let's just say, you know, uh, uh, we just mourn, uh, like this blanket statement, where we just mourn with anyone who's mourning. No, not necessarily. What if somebody's mourning because their friend got caught for bank robbery? And they're really sad, and they're, they're no, I'm not going to mourn with that person. Right? It doesn't mean I'm not going to be gentle and kind, but I'm not going to mourn with them. In the same way, a lot of this, this idea of, of you know, these wrong ideas, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, that verse in the Old Testament. Remember, it's, a, it's about laziness, and it says the man basically doesn't want to get a job. or he he just, He's making excuses for his laziness. He says, you know, I would, but there's a lion outside. There's a lion in the street. It's in the book of Proverbs. I'd have to look for the quote, but it's in the book of Proverbs. He says there's a lion out there in the street. He's scared, right? It's an emotion. Now, as a Christian, should I come alongside him and say, I'm here with you, brother. I know you're scared of that lion. No. And there's really not a lion out there? It's just an excuse? That's not a loving, compassionate thing to do. It's more loving and compassionate to say, let me, let me pull the blind back. And see. There's, there's no lion out there. Hey, hey, give me your hand. Let me walk with you. Let, let me show you. I'll go with you. There's no lion out there. You see, so it's not this blanket statement when these certain people uh, believe that there are certain things that's going on and, and, and in one sense they're whining about it. It's not the church's job to come along and go, well, we mourn with those who mourn. Well, we do. But we've got to make sure what they're mourning over is something that's legitimate or all we're doing is feeding into their self-wallowing and their self-pity. And there's a whole movement out there going on like that today. And some people think that the church's job is to buy them the pity cake. You know, the most loving thing I can do, even if they hate me for it, is to say, look, some of the things you believe that are going on are not going on. And some of the problems that we need to look, we need to stop trying to remove the speck from someone else's eye when we got a log in our own eye. We need to first remove the log from our own eye before we can focus on what's going out on the outside. So, Jonah is in a place where he is Wallowing. I wonder what Jonah's reaction would have been to Paul's conversion. <laughs> you know what I mean? How would Jonah have reacted to Paul's conversion? Verse 4. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? See, the Lord asked him this question twice. He also asked him it in verse 9 uh, about the plant. And this is a rhetorical question. What's a rhetorical? I mean, it's it meaning that it's a question that doesn't need a response. Because the answer is obvious, right? It's kind of more of a rebuke. Is it, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Like, like really? <laughs> Here we go, right? God is not going to mourn with him when he has not a legitimate case to mourn. He's actually going to, you know, come alongside him and say, get over yourself, Jonah. Is it, is it really right for you to be angry? You should be rejoicing. There is, we've heard that when one sinner rejoices, that there is a party in heaven with the angels, we have 120,000 people here repenting and fasting and turning to the Lord. And yet Jonah would rather see them burn. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So we see that he's, he's still moping, he's still drowning in self-pity. And still hoping that God might destroy the city. It's like, maybe, just maybe, we just sit out here on the city just in case. It doesn't go the way he, he, he wants it to. Um, God spares the city to Jonah's despair. We've seen that in chapter 3. Chapter 4 is basically Jonah's moping. Verse 6 through 8. And the Lord God prepared a plan and made it come up over Jonah, that he might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to live than to die. And Jonah is really having a bad day here, right? Especially compared to Job. Job really, you know... Jonah could really teach Job a few things. Really not that bad of a day considering, right? Considering all the things that Job went through. No sarcasm, right? 
compared to Job and, and, and even some of the things that we've been through in our own lives. Jonah is just in, in self pity. Jonah has seen great numbers turn to God, even through his unfaithfulness. Even through his unfaithfulness. Think about the contrast between him and Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet, and he's seen no conversions, yet he was faithful to proclaim God's truth. You see, remember, your ministry is not measured by its success in the sense of its, the world standards by numbers alone but by, by its faithfulness. Remember when, when the Bible says that we will stand before the Lord, he doesn't say, well done, my good and successful servant. No, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Leave the rest to God. You see, that's, that's one of the problems we get into in modern day ministry. We start coming up with our own ideas, our own tactics. The word of God is not good enough, so then so we, we have to put a couple of, you know, we gotta put some bling bling on it, as they say, right? To, to get people attracted and excited. The Word of God is not powerful. We would never say that, but that's why we do these things, right? It's not about our success the way the world defines success. Success is how faithful we were to proclaim the message. And let the Lord worry about those things. John MacArthur, Dr. John MacArthur says this. He says, you worry about the depth of your ministry, and God will worry about the width of it. You worry about the depth of your ministry, and God will worry about the width of it. Don't touch the ark of God. Don't touch the ark of God. As old Ravenhill would say. Many of us know that story. There was a man who thought he could help God out. He thought he could touch the ark of God. We know it didn't end up well for him. And his error was he thought his hands were cleaner than the mud. It wasn't the mud that sinned against God. It was man. It was man. So Jonah loved himself more than he did others. And Jonah loved this plant more than he did the people. Once again, the angels rejoice when one sinner re repents, but Jonah throws a fit. Jonah throws a fit. And we should rejoice, kind of, we should rejoice when one sinner, even our own enemy, comes to the Lord. We should not work, we should not wish the wrath of God upon anyone. That doesn't mean that within this realm of this human realm that we can't um, seek justice, right? Somebody does you wrong, you know? Uh, some people think forgiveness is not allowing them to uh, go through the justice of the law. No, no, that's, that's fine. But we know the difference between that and when we hold bitterness in our heart. And, 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 and justice is actually not enough. What we really want is we want revenge. In fact, a lot of this movement that I was talking about earlier, it's not about justice. It's not about equal rights. It's not, a lot of it's about revenge. A lot of it is about past accounts and, and certain things that we think that your ancestors did to my ancestors or my ancestors did to your ancestors. And we, and we want revenge. That's what we want. We call it justice, but we want revenge. That's not the heart of God. So Jonah sees God's justice as failing, and that's why he is angry. But he has confused justice with, with revenge. You know, when we watched a, a movie before, right? Like a, one of those villain movies. Right? It's not enough at the end when you ever been into the movie and you really start to hate the bad guy. You really, I just don't like this guy. You're right, and it's not enough for him to be caught, tied up, and, and brought to the court. No, no, no. You you want one of those movies where he's running, you know, he's running from the law and he he falls in front of a bus and the bus takes him out. You you like those endings better than him actually being just caught and brought to justice, right? Because ultimately we say we're seeking justice, but a lot of times. It's revenge. There's a difference between justice and revenge. We often cry for justice, but what we're really looking for is revenge. But God's mercy and justice are consistent. But mercy, by definition, means justice will go unserved, right? Well, every religion has this problem except one, right? The fact that, that mercy means that, then that means that justice will go unserved. In, in Islam, hopefully God is just merciful and just, you know, apart from his justice, he's just going to forgive. But what about justice? Every religion, like I said, has that except one. Because in Christianity, justice was served. Justice was poured out upon the Son. He stood and he died in our place. So God is just and also 
the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. It's in the cross that we see God's compassion, right? It's in the cross that we see God's justice. Many have said in the cross is where we see mercy and justice kiss. See, many of us sometimes we only see one realm of the cross, and there's a whole sermon in this one, right? But it, it's so true. We only see the love of God in the cross, and that's definitely there. But there's also the justice of God in the cross. There's also the forgiveness of God in the cross. There's also evil in sin in the cross being dealt with. And there's also in the cross the wrath of Almighty God. And it's in that cross that all of these attributes of God, all these things can be reconciled and harmonized. Right? If not, then it is true. Well, God is, Allah is just merciful. Well, what about his justice? What about his justice? Justice, mercy by definition, means justice goes unserved then. Not in, not in Christianity. Someone had to die. Someone had to pay the price. It was the shedding of the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness. And it was only in the cross that all these things. Why could God forgive this generation of the Ninevites? Why could God forgive Adam, this ball of dirt that rebelled against him? How could God forgive David? The adulterer and the murderer? Imagine, as one preacher says, the accuser. Oh God, where is your justice? Adam? This David? Abraham? A man after your own heart? And God can say, you know where my justice is? Why I can forgive Abraham and Adam and why I can call David my friend? Or Abraham my friend? And David a man after my own heart? Because 2,000 years later on Calvary, there, my son died for them. And now mercy and justice have kissed. And sinners can be reconciled to Christ and to God. God does not exercise his mercy at the expense of his justice. But God exercises mercy through his justice. There's a big difference. He doesn't exercise his mercy at the expense of his justice. He exercises his mercy through his justice. And that justice was poured out upon the cross of Calvary. True love does not exist in the absence of justice, but true love exists in the presence of it. To truly know someone is to truly, to truly love someone is to truly know them. All their flaws, their shortcomings, and make a choice to love them. You see, we project an image to people. So they will like us, but we cover our dark side. People will fall in love with the image of who they think you are, but they won't fall in love with you. Instead of loving us for who we really are, they will, they will love you for who they think you are. If you, really, if you don't really know me, can you really love me? You see, it's easy to love people from a distance. It's easy to say I love you. It's easy to, to love people from a distance. It's a lot harder when you live with them on the day by day. When, when you really get to see all their sin and all these things, and now you have to learn how to love like God. Now you have to learn how to love. Not because of the person, always, but in spite of the person. That's how God loves us. And when we've recognized that love, then we're empowered to learn how to love others in spite of them. God doesn't love us because we are lovely, but God's love will make us beautiful. So that God doesn't love us because, you know, this whole man-centered, you, know, uh, you know, Jesus had a refrigerator picture behind it. <laughs> uh, God doesn't love us because we're lovely. He told Israel, well, why do you love me? I love you because I love you. Because God is love. It's not that he, there's, there's something that, that you, you've drawn him and he, he can't help himself. The only thing we've ever done to draw God is through our, our sinfulness and our rebellion. But in, while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us, that he died upon the cross. But wait a minute, in closing, what about Isaiah's prophecy? That God would destroy the Assyrian Empire. Ultimately, did that prophecy fail because Nineveh repented? Or, or, or what's going on there? We'll get the answer to that next week when we look at the book of Nahum.
And we see the prophecy fulfilled. That God is a loving and a merciful God. And he is slow to anger. But we will learn from the book of Nahum that he will not let the guilty go unpunished. So all men will all men's sin will be dealt with. Either for themselves paying the price for their sin, or they will repent and put their faith in Christ and let Jesus Christ be their mediator and their substitute for their sin. But all sin will be dealt with. God is slow to anger. He is merciful and he is loving. But he will not by no means let the, let the guilty go unpunished. And that's what we will see next week in the book of Nahum. So yes, in the Old Testament there isn't this mean God and this new God. He, is, he brings judgment and love in the New Testament. He brings judgment and love in the Old Testament. All those things reconcile. And only one act in history can reconcile justice and love and forgiveness and evil and mercy and sin and wrath. The cross of Jesus Christ. God bless you.